Hey everybody, David here, and welcome to the ASOG Podcast. In this episode, Lucas and I sit down with a former master-level automotive technician and now a renowned educator and the owner of Farpoint Farms and the Farpoint Farms YouTube channel. He talks about a whole host of different topics from scan tools and toolboxes to cheap cigar reviews. Eric brings his perspective now that his wrenching days are behind him as to what he sees are the challenges facing students trying to enter the automotive field today. Before we begin, if you're on YouTube, please take a moment to hit that like button. It's quick and really helps us out. If you like the content, consider subscribing to the channel. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast listening app, make sure you're set to automatically download the latest episode so you never miss an upload. And now, here we go. David is my friend from Kansas City. He he owns a shop that, well, it's called Done with Auto Repair. <laughs> yeah, I'm done with it. <laughs> <laughs> you sound depressed, words. David. What's that? You sound depressed. Yeah. I was flipping F three fifty V ten. It's misfiring. Can't figure out why it's misfiring. We just put heads on it, like. Um, Seven months ago, maybe. And they just abused this truck. I mean, just abused the hell out of it. So it, it got stolen because that's what it does. It, it gets stolen. And then they bring it in. And they're like, hey, check it over. It got stolen. Oh, my gosh. Like, okay. So we check it out. And it's, I mean, they don't say, they don't tell me any of this. It's just misfiring like crazy. And, of course, of course it's a Ford. So it's like, which cylinder is misfiring? Yes. That's all it says. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, maybe we can isolate it. Problem is it shuts off the injectors. So, you know, you're chasing this cylinder. Well, it's got to be this cylinder here. No, no, it's just shutting off the, cil- the injector randomly. Piece of crap. <laughs> and it can't be anything obvious. Like, it's probably a coil, but they, I don't know. It's hard to get to anything. And I don't know, I was getting frustrated with that piece of crap. And like I said, I've got a bajillion dollars of work just sitting there waiting on a gasket or that needs a hose or. Ugh. That sounds like a anyway. lot of fun. Hey, you know what you should do is if you go build a shop, you can go like work on that. You see, that's the thing. I'm like, <laughs> oh, look, I just need more stress in my life and I want to spend lots of money. No, it's the variety. So so yeah. when the V10 drives you to want to drink, then you go outside and push around a bulldozer and think about, you know, how much it's costing per hour to sit on that thing. The problem exactly. is the V10's See? still there, though. <laughs> like, you come back into the shop, you're like, oh, look, the V10's still here. Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it hasn't fixed itself. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> That's rough. That's rough. So, um, you know, Eric is a educator and a YouTube celebrity. <laughs> All in one. And, um, you know, we've, we, Eric, we've been on this huge kick where we're talking technicians and we're talking, uh, their experiences in the field. And, you know, really, so the past couple of episodes have been us digging in with techs who really had some bad experiences and, and had owners that didn't understand their perspective and in some ways they didn't understand understand the owner's perspective and and you know what the reason we decided to do this i've got this really good friend named jen and jen goes into a automotive group on facebook and she posts it's automotive technicians and she posts like hey if you were going to come work at a shop what would you want right we're seeing so few technicians out there right now Everybody's trying to hire a technician and it seems like everybody, especially for them that they talked to said, I want this, I want this, I want this. And then they would provide their requirements and they would ghost them. They wouldn't show up or they would say, I think I'll stay where I'm at. So she makes this post and she says, what is it that you're looking for? And, and some of the responses were completely rational. Some of the responses were just outlandish. You know, and one of them, I'll never forget, they wanted 80% of the labor dollars sold. Holy like, cow. 
Sure. What are you going to manage the, you know, how are you going to keep the business afloat? Yeah. And then a few days later, you make this really cool video talking about independence, talking about fleets, talking about dealers, talking about the different types of places you can work. And I thought it would be so cool to have you on the show because you've experienced literally every phase of the automotive business you could possibly experience. <laughs> Uh, that's I mean great, that with respect. I know, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's cool. Um, y- you run easily one of the best automotive training programs for students I've ever seen. Well, thank you, sir. You've, you've engaged students like no one I've ever seen before. Tell us a great wealth of knowledge. What are we doing <laughs> wrong? <laughs> like, um, we don't know now. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I really... I, I, and we talked a little bit before about this. I think that we're, it's not so much that anyone's doing anything particularly wrong. I think sometimes new mechanics get a wrong impression of what this industry is at this point. Um, right. The day of, and I still refer to everyone as mechanics, uh, although I know there's that whole back and forth between technician and mechanic. To me, they're still interchangeable. But to children coming into the industry, coming out of schools, I think they really still feel because most of what they're learning in trade schools is mechanics. There's very limited amount of time that we get to spend with them on true diagnostics, true uh, or deep diagnostics. And so I think some of that might be a shock to the system when they, when they get into shops and, you know, you're talking about guys that are GSs, guys that are doing oil changes and tires and they're wanting to move up, but they don't, they don't realize what's involved in moving up. And, and while there is heavier lifting involved as far as, you know, engine repairs and, and heavier repairs on front end and stuff like that, it's that, it's that electrical diag that I try to try to warn my students is coming. And, uh, and, and some of them do embrace it, but a lot of them I think are just shocked when they get to that. Uh, from the mechanic side, from the, from the technician side, having worked at all those industries, man, <laughs> So many, so many places where there's improvements and so many places where there's miscommunication between owners uh, or, or general managers and technicians. And I think it builds this wall, this barrier between the front and the back that, that really poisons a lot of otherwise good shops. And I've been blessed to work at shops where that didn't exist, but I've also been cursed enough to work at a few shops where it did. And it's been interesting to see. Right. Well, and, and, you know, look, I'm, I hate to call you out like this, but I mean, <laughs> There's no way you're saying you worked on Volvos. Um, <laughs> I mean, at this point, yeah. we know you're nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, sanity's not even <laughs> a question. With Volvos. It, it might be why I'm a good teacher is because compared to working on Volvos, everything seems easy. You know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> kids are going crazy. That's nah, not, that's not a problem really. That, that doesn't even phase me compared to, that's compared it. to you know, 400 uh, network codes that I have to yeah, sort so through I was this say, 2300 network communication <laughs> faults. You just Which, clear all as well. Yeah. Clear all oh man. <laughs> oh, oh, if only it were so simple, right? <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've never seen a car line that is so has such advanced wiring that you can solve a problem by simply reaching down, grabbing a harness, picking it up and pulling on it a little bit. So all the insulation <laughs> falls off and the car catches on fire. I mean, the problem solved, the car burnt to the ground. It's not my problem. Uh, anymore. You know. and, I, and, and, you know, and that's the beauty of Volvo is that's, that's not a new trick. They had that one back in the early eighties as well as I, I remember having to explain to a customer uh, who came in for a starter replacement that they needed an entire engine harness. And they were like, what? No, you know, took them outside and showed them the confetti right. <laughs> that used to be the insulation on their harness. And was like, yeah, I, I, that's not going to, a starter's not going to fix that. Yeah. So. Ever since you worked on my car. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you're oh, yeah. right. I mean, ever yeah. since I <laughs> opened the hood and all the wires fell apart. Yeah. <laughs> and there's been, uh, there's been a time or two where I've had to have that conversation too. Well, you see, I had to remove your intake manifold to replace this. And when I did, every piece of insulation came off your wiring harness. So yeah. what would you like me to do? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and, you know, the little thing where oil seeps out of this component called the cam cover and, <laughs> and all these shops, and they, I, I'll never forget it. I had a car towed in here one time and the guy said, I tried to change my own valve cover gasket. Oh, and geez. I said, your car doesn't have valve covers. And he said, yeah, I figured that out. <laughs> Like, what do you mean? He's like, I took all those bolts out and that belt thing on the end came off and all this <gasps> stuff sprang out and, and it was not good. 
Oh, oh man. that sucks, man. <laughs> He's like, don't worry, yeah. I put it back together. It just doesn't run. I am oh, not touching it, that. Oh, I am no. not touching that. Yeah. Step one, replace motor. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I bought this little car one time and it, it came from a good friend of mine. Um, and he, he had it towed in and it, I come to work one morning and it's sitting out in the lot. I called him and I said, Hey Kent, what's going on with the Volkswagen? And he said, um, well, I was going down the road and have you ever put a bunch of like open end wrenches in a metal trash can and rolled it down a hill? <laughs> no, I haven't. Well, if you did, that's what it would sound like. Oh gosh. Ken, have you ever put a timing belt in the car? A, a what? Yeah. 200,000 miles on a single timing belt. It's cool. No problem. Aww. <laughs> it did everything it could. Good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. two hundred thousand. That's impressive. Listen, a TDI <laughs> Volkswagen, you can't kill. You just can't do it. It's not possible. Apparently, the EPA found a way. <laughs> 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 That's rough. <laughs> that is rough. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I I feel for them. I've got a couple of them that come through, and um. And they just keep going back for recalls and for bulletins nonstop and extended warranty coverage. And my clients are just like, look, I love my car, but having to go to Hickory to get it worked on sucks. Yeah. This is no fun at all. And, and like, we're talking four, five, six times a month. These cars are having to go down there. I, I don't know. For legitimate problems or for like emissions related garbage? Emissions related garbage. Ah, screw that. Yeah. Well, we've got a uh, customer that has a Tiguan that we just do the regular maintenance on. It's still under warranty. And and she was complaining of that recently too, is that that drive is just such a pain and it's frequent. Because like you said, they're, they're constantly having updates even to the newer line, you know, gas engines. They're just, they have a lot of, you know, they're kind of user intensive cars. So. They're working She's, things out, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of companies do R and D before they sell the car, but not not uh, not Volkswagen. That's they it. Just, the, just let the customer yeah, buy it. You were the it out thing, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I had I had a for. gal come in today. She drops off a 2019 Civic, and she's like, "If this thing's shaking at 60 miles an hour," and we didn't even pull into the bay. Uh, my the service advisor looked down at the tires and the tires were bald and what, <laughs> what little rubber was still left was like chopped up. And so it had a high spot, low spot and it was all bald. There was no tread on these tires, just high spot, low spot and all the way around all the tires, all four It had like 47,000 miles on it. And so we called her up and we're like, well, we're pretty sure that the vibration is coming from your tires are destroyed. So tires, alignment, and we'll look the car over and see if it needs anything else. She had a CarMax warranty, and she's like, the, will warranty cover this? <sighs> no, no, it's tires. It's just regular maintenance. You have to replace them every so often. She started crying on the phone. She said, every single time I go to a shop, they want to charge me $800 just to fix what's wrong with it. And I thought I bought a good warranty, and obviously not. I'm just going to go buy a new car. <laughs> And we told her, I said, it doesn't matter what you buy. You're going to have to pay for maintenance. And newer cars are just, they're expensive. You're going to have to buy, you know, pay for for regular maintenance regardless. The, the oil change is more expensive. You know, usually bigger wheel and tire packages on, on newer vehicles. There's no getting around this. And, you know, maybe you just didn't have some of these other previous charges explained to you properly. But, you know, things like brakes and, and just... Normal wear and tear isn't covered by a warranty. Just bawling on the phone. Picked it up. She said, I'm going to go trade it in. I'm going to get something else. Didn't have the money, but could still trade it in. And I don't know, she's probably upside down on her second or third car. Just keeps flipping the loan into oh, man. probably owes sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 on a $20,000 car. I, I just don't understand. I, I don't get it. How it's do. getting to be pretty common, though. It is. It really is. We, we run it into it constantly. We absolutely run into it constantly. People just are, they're appalled. I had a guy get upset. We charged them a hundred bucks for a, uh, an oil change on a Yukon Denali. I think that's what it was. And it was, it, it needed Dexos two, long life oil filter, the whole nine. It was a hundred bucks, seven quarts or whatever the hell it holds. 
And he was just like, I've never paid this much before. I said, I get it. But they're not putting the correct oil in it. This is Dexos 2 approved 020 or whatever it is, 530, whatever. And he's like, yeah, but I've never paid that much. They were using the correct oil. And I'm like, synthetic. I'm like, no, 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 not synthetic. Dexos 2 synthetic. It's a different type of synthetic. It has to have that designation. And he goes, I just don't understand. I just don't understand. He got upset. <laughs> And this is like just constant and you have to explain <laughs> different types of synthetic oil. So the shops out there that are telling people I'll change your oil, full synthetic oil. And they're letting them walk out the door thinking that whatever garbage oil they just put in this vehicle is Dexos two approved and it's not or LL zero one or what, what's the new designation for BMW mini? Oh, it's it's, a, like, it's like they changed viscosity, the like, yeah, they changed the way it's FE written. Up. Something or another. And yeah, there's so many designations now. It has to be the correct weight. It has to have the right designations. It has to have the right oil filter on there now. Like for example, the old uh, Honda 1356, the Wix number, right? 1356 is now a 7356, and even the 7356, there's an extended life 7356. So if these people are going more than 5,000 miles between oil changes, and you know they are, <laughs> they should be getting the longer life oil filter. So that oil filter can't be the $2 oil filter that you've been putting on for forever. Now it has to be the $5 oil filter, you know, $5 at our cost or whatever. But yeah. That checks up the price of the oil change. It's not it's $70, $80 now to change your oil and you know, I'm just getting, it's only if it's the first time, the first time they're coming in and they're just, I ah, throw an oil change on there. I think it's going to be another 20 bucks. It's almost a hundred dollars more. And they're just like, why is it so much more? It's like, well, you asked us to change the oil. Yeah. But it, you didn't get prior approval. You didn't call yeah, them and tell course, them. But they were, you know, you tell them, oh, well, I'll send you the updated link. We don't even put the thing on there. Like, you know, we'll, it'll, we'll be like, oh, okay. Three days later when we get to the car, then we'll throw it up. And they're at that point. They're not even looking. Are you kidding me? Well, you know, here's the deal is that, that Peter Orlando, who works for CTI, wrote a whole class on oil specifications, filtration, the whole nine yards. And, and it is extremely in-depth. And, and I hate to say that I think many shops wouldn't attend that class just simply because I don't know how to change the oil in car. Um, and I don't mean that with any disrespect. Please, nobody send me hate mail. Oh, Dutch. <laughs> send all the hate um, mail to me and I will forward it to Lucas. <laughs> don't you worry. He is that. looking his nose down at you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, interesting for me is, is especially the new JLRs, right? The new Land Rovers. You want to see somebody get upset about an oil change. Now, they just bought a $200,000 car, $100,000 car, $70,000. I, I, I would never buy one, so I've never looked at the price. But when pretty, they see though. the price of that they new oil. They pretty, pretty cars. They really are. They really are. But when they see the price of the new oil that goes in the new ones, you want to see somebody get upset. And it's that, that stuff is hard to find. Have, have either one of you tried to look for it? I haven't. I, mean, I wasn't it's a, aware that they had changed what's, it. What, what do you define as new? Uh, they twenty twenty and twenty twenty one has a oh, new no. oil spec for. Um, yeah. huh. hang on. The, the problem is, I've got a I've got a JLR dealership like a few blocks away from me. You so, suck. No, no. <laughs> well, I just I never see them because they're they go right back to the dealer. And these I, I will say these dealerships around here, they are. They are really good at scaring people into coming back to them. Oh, we're the only ones that are certified to work on Jaguars. You have to come back to me. Not that I don't mind on the Jaguars, but we've done our fair share of Land Rovers. I'm comfortable working on them. And, but the, these people get scared. Oh, I got to go back to the dealer. They told me, they told me. Same thing with BMW. The Euro shops that are in my area, we have several Euro shops in our area. I mean, they don't even have factory tooling. And so they're doing like 15 year old euros and aren't necessarily seeing, you know, vehicles that are just out of warranty because everybody else is just going back to the dealership and the dealership has them on absolute lockdown. It's pretty impressive to see what they've done. The, I've kind of wondered how that's here. playing out. You know, I left in 2013, um, working on European stuff and just went into general service, but the, uh, 
like, it, you know, we, we kept our shop, we worked at an independent shop and we kept up with stuff. And I mean, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment when you know they'd roll out a new engine for some of these cars and you'd have to buy all the diagnostic equipment specialty tools then for an independent doing that that was pretty tough but i kind of wonder there have been several generational changes since then if most european shops are still able to do that or if they've kind of coasted and it sounds like from what you're saying at least in your area they're coasting yeah i mean i i have friends who own a european shop and uh you know, when something comes through the shop and the the biggest thing that trips me up is quoting it out because especially when you're talking about, let's say a BMW, like when you're in there, you want to know exactly what do I need to replace? Cause I'm going to get killed if I have to eat anything. So I need to know exactly what gaskets am I going to be uh, needing to replace? What additional components are high failure rate components that if i take it off i can't just put it back in you, yeah. you see what i'm saying like you know if i'm doing a head on a you know 05 x5 this is what we ran into here recently we had a we had a confirmed bad cylinder head on an x5 and it was right before they switched over to the magnesium block or whatever but uh i, I reached out to him i said you know am i gonna have to replace this component that component this other component i don't know we just don't deal with enough of them to say that, yeah, I mean, if I touch it, I'm going to have to replace it. You you get me and most other vehicles, especially if we ran into it, we probably have enough experience with it that if I touch it, I better replace it because otherwise it's going to come right back with ever since you. And yeah. so that's what we get tripped up with on some of these European vehicles. We know those components fail. We just don't know, is that going to be reusable or not? And that's what we end up getting tripped on. But you reach out to them and they'll, they'll tell you, yeah, it's fine. What are you running? Oh, I'm running an Autel, maybe a, an old uh, Autologic. And that's really? it. Like, yeah. And they, they get by with it. And I have no idea how they do it. They get by oh, wow. with it and they're doing just fine. Happy customers. They're profitable. They're doing really well. And just, and, and well, it makes you wonder if they're, uh, yeah, I wonder if they're turning away some of the jobs that, you know, they're, they're taking the, not the low hanging fruit, but the, you know, they're shaking the tree pretty good. But at some point they're just saying, yeah, you know, maybe you do want to go to the dealer for that one. Uh, uh, I, I just we, wonder because, yeah. We, we've had several uh, people here on the, this podcast here recently where, I mean, they just, they're making the case for not even letting certain um, programming go to the dealership. To just get equipped and be able to do it because if you do let it go to the dealership, the dealership will wrap their arms around that person and not let them go. They're oh, going to yeah. start marketing to them. They're going to, like, if they know they went to the dealership, hey, did you know this was recently at our facility? If you didn't tell them, but if you do tell them or whatever, or you send them down there, they're like, oh, your, your shop that you're going to right now is doing this wrong. They didn't know about this. You know, look, look at all these recalls or all these TSBs or whatever. Like we have to do, we can do that here at the dealership. They don't even know anything about it. And all of a sudden they're just putting, they're planting that seed of doubt in the customer's mind that maybe I shouldn't be going to that independent repair shop. Maybe the dealership's right. Like I need to go back to the dealer. We, and I'm going to date myself here, but we ran into that issue. And this was back in 2000, maybe 2001 where we started seeing more and more components um, that needed downloads. And while we were trying to decide whether it was financially sound to invest in the software and the tool, um, we would do as a courtesy is we would replace the part. We'd bring the car over to the dealership and have it, you know, reprogram, bring it back for the customer. But they were still getting that information and they were, and then they were using it to market to those customers. Yeah. So we lost sales that way as well. And that kind of helped push our company at the time to the future. It was like, okay, you know, well, financially it might be a big hit up front, but you're right. Yeah, they're, they are, they're, they're going to, they're going to hit them with advertising and they're going to, they're going to have them. So, uh, that's a good point. Just plant that seed of doubt. That's all they need to do. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh, and that, and that's, that, that was the, at least the case that they were making, um, to, to tool up and just be able to be self-sufficient, be able to do just about it. And they, they, you almost end up making the case for specialization um, yeah. rather than than tooling up for every single make and model. Say, okay, well, you're not going to drop the whatever tens of thousands of dollars to be able to tool up 
on a Mercedes. So you just don't do Mercedes. Yeah. Uh, and you focus in on what you can tool up for and leave the rest to whoever decides to invest in the tooling. But then you still run into the situations where a customer may have, you know, a Volkswagen, Mercedes, and a Buick. Well, you can work on the Volkswagen, you work on the Buick, but all of a sudden you don't want to touch the Mercedes. I don't know. We, we ran into that where we had good customers that had cars that we didn't normally work on. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, and, and not being a service writer at the time, but just being in the back, I think it was kind of basis case by case, you know, Hey, we'll get into the, we'll get into your routine maintenance, but we did turn away bigger jobs on, on makes and models. We just weren't familiar with. And yeah. there were times when people would have something towed to us and, and it was like, Ooh, wow. You know, we didn't work on American stuff. We had no equipment for it. So if it was something that could be fixed, it was fixed. But if it was something that required serious diag, yeah, we, we made a apologetic phone call and wished them the best. So what, what do you think about this? Uh, this was a, um, a tech who had posted on one of the forums on Facebook and he said that he was, he was needing to program a new transmission on a Nissan. And I think the cost of programming, it was going to be, uh, and I know that they just put out a new J 25 or, um, a new J box version of their programming or whatever. Um, but this was going to be like 350 bucks to program this one vehicle where yeah. if they took it to the dealership, th- there, there wouldn't be an additional cost to programming the, the vehicle. And so the tech was sort of stuck in the middle and he said he didn't want to charge the additional money. He didn't want to eat it. He didn't want to charge the additional money. It was sort of unfair for the customer because they brought it to them and had they taken it to the dealership, it probably would have been about the same to replace the transmission minus the additional fee that they would have to pay plus the markup to do the programming because he was simply under equipped. Yeah. And so there was a shop owner that got, that made the case and said, no, you charge the customer. They brought it to you. You've got to make sure that you make money. There are no, there shouldn't be any unprofitable jobs in your shop. You don't need the 350. Uh, you, you know, you charge it and you mark it up. And the technician came back with your, you're penalizing the customer for you being under equipped. Yeah. Which I, I have to agree with that. I would not charge me personally would not charge the customer. I would eat the three fifty. What we've done in the past, whenever we had a situation like that is I towed the sucker up to the dealer, but we have, you know, 15 Nissan dealerships within a mile of me. So we just tow it up to the nearest Nissan dealership and tell them, Hey, I need you to program this thing for me. We just install the transmission. They charge me whatever 150 bucks to go out there with their uh, doodad and, and uh, flash it real quick. And then we drive it away. Uh, simple for me, but you know, you and Lucas, you're out in Timbuktu, you know, <laughs> it's a 45 hour drive to the nearest, whatever dealership, <laughs> you know, w- what do you do? The, the customer, the customer shouldn't be penalized for you being under equipped. Well, but you I mean, also at the same time, maybe only deal with, you know, three Nissans that need factory tooling and factory software a year. So dropping six grand on that garbage isn't, doesn't make any sense. So what do you do? Most of what is up here, we have access to, right? There, there's very, very limited, um, you know, Volkswagen, some of the euros, and our auto logic covers most all of that for us, right? Um, I've got connections at Nissan. I've got connections at at Toyota and Subaru and Ford. And you know, if if there's an instance where I get into something I can't do, I can go there. But a, a bigger question is, and and you know, Eric, you brought this up before we started the podcast, and um, I'm going to touch on this very lightly. Uh, <laughs> You know, Tanner said something, David, do you remember when Tanner was talking about the, the text that could not email and could not use a cell phone? Yeah. <laughs> well, before you got on, Eric and I were talking about some of the local dealerships and he brought up one of the dealerships has, how old did they say he was? The A-Tech? He was 61. Right. I, I know one of the diesel techs in town is in his sixties and, and basically said, look, they're paying me so much that I would be a fool to retire. Because they can't get anybody else. I've got them. They can't do anything without me. 
I'm the only diesel tech that will work for them. Yeah. And that, that was, that was what this guy was telling me. Only a tech that they could get. And it took, it took him uh, six or seven months to find them. He'd been working there four months, but they had to get him off from off the mountain. And, and, and uh, so here's my question is, is the technology that's coming into even the dealerships now is becoming more and more advanced. They can't, you know, many of these dealerships are being staffed with older and older guys, right? I think with the exception of, of the Dodge dealership in town, the other shops have fairly older guys working for them. And the other guys aren't really interested in learning technology. Do we eventually hit a spot where even the dealerships are penalized by the age of the technician that they're able to find and the ability that that technician has versus the new technology we're seeing enter the field. I mean, yeah, it's, no, it's no, even no. Hold bigger. On, hold on, hold on. Before we get into that, are you charging the customer for the 350, Lucas, or are you eating it? I want no, I'll probably eat it. I'll probably eat it. I I, I just, look, I, I think. I'm, I'm going to tell you, like the, the shop owner that said he would absolutely charge the customer the additional money. That guy makes bank. I know. Well, of course he does. He makes good money. He runs, he, you know, he sends the coupons out. He does that whole whole shtick. Why but, you got to talk about Jay like that? Um, it's not Jay. It's not Jay. No, this guy's in a small town too. So everybody's like, oh, I'm in a small town. I can't make any money. Blah, blah, blah. They need to talk to this guy. This guy's, uh, I think he eclipsed $2 million in, he, I mean, in sales a year in a, he, in a very small town. Here's um, my perspective of it. If if the client came to you because they did not want to go to the dealership, they came to you because of your value equation, right? And you That's were not transparent. The case, though they came to, and like they came to this guy, they would have come to this guy because he dumps the entire area with really, really well priced. Let's call them that oil changes, and so he just pumps cars through his shop. Yeah, so I, I got to be honest. With he, you. No, threw, I would not charge my client. Well, he he threw this quote out. He said, um, and he, he was quoting a shop owner that's in in my area. Uh, again, also runs a very large facility, pumps a ton of cars through his shop, and he said there are no bad jobs, just poorly priced ones. <laughs> Essentially, whatever your cost is, you do mark it up and you sell it. It is what it is. But at the same time, though, the technician I thought had a point. You're, yeah, you're penalizing I the customer for you being under tooled. I agree with that. And I, I'll be honest with you. I worry sometimes as a shop owner I, and, and, and I've learned to deal with it. I had kind of, I don't want to say I, I would worry about losing sight of my client or losing sight of the work that's in the shop. But, you know, as someone who is the technician and then the service writer, a shop owner who completely disconnects kind of loses sight of of that emotional connection, right? And and for me, I was always the perfectionist. But isn't that I what they're like? Isn't that what you're sold? Being able to disconnect completely. You take somebody uh, like Sam Johnson, who's like, oh, I come in a couple times a week, but you know, I pull my salary for what I do at the shop, and then the rest of it is paid out as a absolutely. I'm using the guys at the beach all day. I'm listen. I'm not disagreeing with that, and I I, I think my point is is that for me. That's not what I would choose to do. I would not I choose to completely disconnect from the shop. <laughs> um, and I'm message and, him, <laughs> see what he <laughs> says. <laughs> and and the real reason is is that I really care about my client. I want what's best for them. I really care about the car that's in the shop. I want the car to be fixed correctly. So I can't allow myself to fully disconnect like that. But but my point is is they lose sight of that. Right? Does that make sense? They lose sight of what it takes. And, and all of the factors that go into that, because they're not on that front counter having to tell Mrs. Customer, you pay it because they just tell the service advisor, hey, listen, you charge them for that. And that's the end of the communication yeah. for them. They don't see what the end result is. I will say a slightly different take on this, um, not with software downloads, but still with tooling. There have been a few times in my career where we worked on something that had just rolled off, you know, just come out of warranty, where it required us, you know, a cam seal tool or something, you know, some random piece that we just didn't have yet. And I have built those tools into estimates before, but in that case, 
you know, the customers had the option whether the price was reasonable or not. Right. But trying to hit him with that after the fact, you know, that. Well, I I think he, this was, this was something that he was maybe pricing out or whatever. So he was building the estimate at that point. Yeah. You know, it's, if I, I, I I eat that every single time. That's probably why I don't have a boat. But the reason (laughs) being that I shouldn't have taken that job on. And that, that's really what, what it comes down to, I guess, in my mind is if I'm willing to tell the customer, yes, I'm going to do that job, then I should be tooled up to do the job. In yeah, other words, I'll be willing to tool up. What's that? Or be willing to tool up. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. I, if I'm not willing to tool up at my cost and have it added into my overhead, then I shouldn't take the job on and I should just punt the, the job down the street and say, hey, I just don't, I don't have it. But then at the back of my mind, I'm going, well, the guy down the street doesn't have it either. I bet you he's going to roll the cost of that tool into the repair. Or they're just going to do some hacky way of getting around doing using the proper tool. And, yeah. and then you're like, well, I'm going to tell the customer that I can't do the job. But I'm also going to tell them, don't take it down the street either, because that guy doesn't know what he's doing either. And so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I send stuff to the dealers from time to time. And, and if, if what you, do you know, send to the dealers, I send, you know, if it's a job that that could be under warranty or it's a job that may have extended warranty, we, we check for that. Okay. If it's something well, we're not tooled up for and it's something that we're probably not going to see a lot of. Yeah. We're going to send it to the dealer. We're, yeah, you know, maybe I'm okay with that. But I, I, I run into stuff that we're not tooled up for. Like I just dropped 200 bucks for some chain timing. It was a chain holding tool on a uh, GM36 to fix a camshaft end play problem that's causing a VVT code to, to kick on. And the, the, the camshaft like pivots forward and backwards it shifts back and forth and it and it causes uh, a, a weird signal and the computer freaks out and it throws that vvt code but then you check the end play and you're like okay well what's the fix you just slap a couple shims in there that that fixes it but part of installing the shims is you've got to pull the the um the phasers out it's meaning you have to hold the timing chain so you have two, two options you can either get the timing chain holding tool and hang the thing up and hold the chain in place. And the tool, the knockoff tool, is two hundred bucks. The OE tool is four hundred. Or you got to pull the chains or the timing cover completely off, and then it turns into a fifteen-hour job instead of a two-hour job. Yeah, I was going to say those three sixes are. It can be kind of fun. Yeah. Uh- so I just I, I bought the knockoff tool and we uh, probably I, never going to see another one again. That's what I was going to say. I've got boxes of timing tools back here. <laughs> like I know that's what I'm saying. Like I, I don't I don't send it to the dealer. Like it's it's got to be something really weird for me to go. Eh, I'm just going to send this to the dealer. Yeah, but you're not going to charge them for it. That's why you've got dead beavers. And banners, well, yeah. And you plug. I don't walls. charge them for it. That's that's the problem. Is it ends up, you know, that one month, you're doing your numbers, and you're like, how did I go up eight hundred percent in my tool cost this month? Oh, that's right. But that <laughs> stupid timing tool for that one car, I'm never going to work on again. <laughs> Eric, when you were in shops, what you know, that tooling aspect? Because I I know, you know, we won't name them, but I know some of the shops you worked for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, you, you came from shops that were tooled and at an, an extremely high level to a shop that was less tooled <laughs> and, yeah. and was probably less focused on quality. And, you know, so the, the big conversation has really been like, what, what is it that technicians are looking for? Why are good technicians leaving shops? And, and so what was your perspective of that coming from these really amazing shops? And, and I'm not saying the shop you were at was not amazing. I don't mean that in a negative way. Oh, it we had different. a different focus for sure. Yeah. Yeah. What was and, that like? What was that experience? Uh, it was an interesting way. Most techs, I think, start their career where I ended mine. 
And, uh, and so my perspective is probably very different than most folks would be, but, um, yeah, you go from a place where, uh, you know, quality is wanted much higher over quantity because the, the risk versus reward is so high there. You know, you want to have these customers coming back. They have, you know, high end customers, high end paychecks and, um, to go to a place that serviced, you know, just about anything. And yeah, as far as tooling goes, you bought it yourself or, um, you may do, you know, that was, that was a shock to the system. And of course, <laughs> at that level, you do turn a lot of stuff away. If we're going to talk about franchise work, I mean, that's, they're, they're, they're bottom, bottom feeders. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. There's a lot of me money to be made at the bottom. And there's a lot of guys that make a decent living, never being more than a C tech or a B tech. Uh, but they're never really experiencing the career. They're never really, you know, exploring what, what it really is to be a tech. And, um, you know, I, I did a lot of teaching, but I also did some learning while I was, while I was at that position. So it's was, it was kind of interesting. Like I said, I think if I had started there, I don't know that my career would have gone where it went. Right. You know, where's the reward in moving up? Where's the reward in, in figuring out what no one else wants to figure out? There isn't any. Not, not at that type of facility. So, well, um, and, and you know that you bring up some interesting points with that. And, and it's something that David and I have talked about very frequently is that, um, and, and you'll appreciate this because you see a, an education, edu, <laughs> if I could talk, you see in education, a completely different perspective than the rest of us see. And, and so we talk frequently about the fact that, um, the world doesn't need all ATEX. The shops couldn't hire all ATEX if they wanted to, right? Yeah. The, you could probably have one or two good ATEX, but in a lot of ways, they probably couldn't feed four Eric's yeah. in a shop like that. And so, you know, from the education standpoint, I know you see different types of, of students who all have different perspectives and all have different abilities and, and different desires. Yeah. What's your take on the fact that, you know, we can't have all A tags, you know, we, we need that C tech, we need that B tech, but we also want to provide them a long career in this field. We want to provide a way for them to grow and, and continue to come up and, and have a rewarding career. It needs to be a career. It doesn't need to be a job. How do we do that? So, you know, I don't, this is going to be tough for me to answer because there's a lot of my heart in that answer. Um, I see students with varying degrees of ability that all have the same desire, right? They all want to be mechanics or technicians. And some of them have the potential because of the curiosity and the drive and the determination are you telling the dumb ones they can't make it? No, I'm not going to tell them. That. <laughs> there's, there's no dumb ones. For, but you have guys that just are never going to be able to grasp some of these networking issues that we come across. But they might be the guy that have no problem taking those cam phasers out. You know, so they have a real good mechanical aptitude. But some of the some of the real cerebral computer problems and some of the diagnostic equipment that they're exposed to while they're with me. You can see it fly right over their head. And so I feel like for me, it's a win no matter what. These guys are going out. Some of them will grow into a role where they'll be able to, to pick up those more complex things. And some won't. But that's the ones that won't. I, yeah, I still want them to have a successful career. And they can as a B-Tech. You know, as it gets on into the future, I might, might become harder and harder. But there's all, I don't care what kind of, I don't care if it's hydrogen, electric, you know, nuclear, it's going to have tires on it and they're going to need to be changed. And so if there's a guy who has a passion for turning wrenches and that is as far as his career ever progresses, who am I to complain? You know, what, you know, what do you think it is? You know, you deal with a lot of young people, right? Yeah. And, and we've talked about this in the group at length. And, and it's gone over and over and over again. And and I even brought it up. We were in a meeting last night and I brought it up to you. Um, I want to say that you either commented or maybe I tagged you in a post that somebody made within our group. And they were talking about 
um, hiring a young person to come into the shop. Yeah. And they said, look, I've hired all these people from the local high school and they don't know anything or the community college, whatever it was. They don't know anything. And and I, I hired them. I put them in a bay and I let them go. And they just cost me money. <laughs> and I don't understand why they can't just get in there and get the work done. This guy didn't bill 40 hours for six months. <laughs> and, and I think it's important. We set those expectations. Yeah. I'd be more worried if a, one of my students got free in the world and did turn 40 hours the first week he was out there. Cause I, <laughs> right. you better go back and check every one of those nuts and bolts, buddy. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I'm under the belief that, that, you know, three to five years, yeah. Right. And, and we talk a lot on the podcast about Bridget because Bridget's my apprentice and, um, and you know, we have seen her grow so much in the last three years. You, she's not even the same person, but if I had had those expectations that I have now, three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, it would not be a good experience for her or I. I think we have to really set a fundamental growth program in place in the shop for them. And I think we've got to start hiring younger techs. You know, you've seen that meme going around that says looking for technician, um, you know, hopefully 18 years old with 20 years of experience. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's unrealistic. And, and I think we've got to start hiring younger technicians. How can we get them more engaged? What, what can we do as shop owners to get them involved, get them to come out and hang out at the shops? What can we do to, to begin to foster that engagement and get them excited? How can we accomplish that? Well, let me hold you to two points. The first is you want an 18-year-old with 20 years of experience. If you want an 18-year-old with 20 years experience, you need to hire an 18-year-old and put him side by side with a guy with 20 years of experience and make him his mentor. And you Amen. need to glue those like two together that. for a couple of years. That's how you get a tech that's 18 that has experience. Yeah. Uh, you you got to have somebody else's brain working alongside of his to show them all the things that we just can't do. You know, it, if you're talking about a, a, a college student who goes every day to an automotive, uh, you know, college class, maximum amount of time spent six hours. How much actual time do you think is spent? You know, we're learning fundamentals, they're learning theories, but it's all fun and games until you start turning wrenches, until you're out yep. there doing it. And that might only be an hour, an hour and a half a day. So yep. the expectation that somebody's going to roll in and turn 40 hours a week or, or just be vastly a wealth of knowledge, it's not there, man. We come out of the industry with kids that have the foundations. I keep them right. safe. I make sure that they're not going to drop a car their first day on the job, that they're not going to wreck a car. Uh, I, I try to give them advice on what kind of tools they're going to come into the you know program with. And But beyond that, no, 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 no. You have, <laughs> you have to send them up with a mentor. You have to have, you know, if you're a good owner, if you're a good boss, uh, if you're a good manager, you're going to, you're going to tuck them in under the wing and make sure that they don't go in the wrong directions. Right now, as far as what you're, what you're asking Lucas, as far as, you know, how do we get, these kids involved? How do we get them interested? I think, I think what I'm trying to do in, in our town is, is a good model for that. I don't know if it's the only way to do it, but it's the way that, that I'm trying to do it. And it, and it does seem to be making some inroads and that is, <laughs> it does. It, yeah, just engagement. Now there's too many instructors in this field who are at the end of their careers as mechanics and they just want to sit it out and maybe draw a pension and they come in with no passion. They hate cars. That's why they quit working on them. And, uh, and they come into a classroom and they babysit. They, they take a very poor approach where you should have guys that are maybe a little younger, a little younger than me, to be honest with you. I feel like I'm about 10 years too late to this game and I wasn't planning on getting into this game for another 10. So it's been an interesting uh, wake up call, but yeah, we, we, we need to have guys with passion. You know, Lucas, I think I came and visited you about, well, before, before the COVID stuff hit. And I said, Hey man, right. what do you think about being a teacher? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got passion and it shows, and I don't care if you're teaching, you know, auto tech or nursing or math. If you have passion, if you have a genuine interest and you show that spark to kids, they're going to catch fire. I mean, they're, they're right. going to feel it. And, and I think we've seen that locally in a big way. 
right? I, I think it's uh, it's been really amazing to see it and and to see the opportunities grow and build for them. And, and you know, we talk about that proficiency. And Matt Fonslow was on um, a couple weeks ago. And, and one of the things that we keep bringing up that he said, we're talking about ASE and talking about what is an ASE certification. And he said, an ASE master certification is a base level proficiency. Yeah, it's again, and it's me theory. and David are like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yeah. what? So you know the it, theory. You're able to to comprehend and and spit it back out. But can you duplicate? You know, can you can you take that and go somewhere with it? Exactly, exactly. And and you know, so my big thing with it is, is at the end of the day, like, you know, these shop owners are kind of expecting these students to come out, and they're they the graduated high school and college. They should they should be able to fix cars. Oh man, you don't know what it takes to fix a car, do you? <laughs> you I would know? I would have lost my job out of out of college within the first six months three times if I hadn't had a mentor, if I hadn't had somebody yeah. who was, you know, a battle buddy or whatever you want to call it, but somebody that was there at that shop who kept an eye on me and, you know, watched me progress. And every time yeah. they gave me something bigger to chew on, was there to make sure that I didn't, you know, spit it out in a giant pile of mess. So I That's I it. can't and- stress that enough to people. And, and anytime I'm going out and helping kids get jobs, I'm talking to them and telling them exactly what to expect. Well, and I mean, it's, it's that feel right, right before the bolt breaks, it's the sound it makes. It's how the end of the ratchet feels. It's when you pull the trigger on the air gun and you realize it's going the wrong direction because (laughs) the way it sounds, you know, um, it's the fact that, that, you know, like ringer bolts are a different thread than you might expect when you go to take them out. You know, you learn these things. They're very important things to learn, but it takes experience and it's a lot easier to learn them. If you have that mentor, if you have that person sitting with you yeah, going through it. And, and, you know, one of the things that I think as a whole nationwide that we need to improve on is I really think there needs to be a program. I think there needs to be structure for when they come into the shops and, you know, North Carolina has got this really cool apprenticeship program through IGO. And I think if we could come up with a way that there is a structured, here's what you need to work on with this student. If you can cover this, this is what we're working on now. Right. And, and really bring in some, some ability to connect what they're learning in the book with what they're seeing in the shop, because that's, that's like, you know, kind of putting two and two together. I want that because that's that extension that we're talking about. That's that next step. It's not throw you to the wolves. It's not drop you on your head and see if you bounce. It's let's, let's, let's move on with this training. Let's make you a Jedi, you know, Exactly. (laughs) but let's, you gotta have a, you gotta have a master to teach the Jedi. And right. You know, expecting a kid that's gotten all the theory, but none of the, Hey, how tight is tight? Yeah. It's so <laughs> funny. Like the kids, you know, and obviously there's torque specs for everything. We certainly teach that sort of stuff, but to, you know, I say there's, there's levels of tightness kids, you know, you got drain plug tight, you got lug nut tight, you know, there's right, CV right, axle right. tight, you know, and, and, you know, how do you write that in a book? How do you write that on a board? How do you show, you can't show a video of that. You can't, give a lecture on that. You go outside and you demonstrate and you show them and yeah, maybe we'll get the torque wrench out and I'll, I'll, I'll tighten something down. And then we get the torque wrench and take a look at it and say that, yeah, look at that. That's about 15 pounds, but you can't tell a kid, Hey, 17 foot pounds on that drain plug and expect, unless they grab a torque wrench when they come to your shop, which they're probably not going to do that, you know, that they're going to know what 17 pounds feels like the first time they tighten a drain plug. Exactly. So, Exactly. And, and even little things like, you know, we, we noticed one of the cool things about Bridget is, 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 you know, she takes initiative, right? And I hear guys talk all the time in, in shops and they're saying, I, I don't know if I would ever hire a woman technician. I'm going to tell you what. Oh, man. That's where it's at. Yeah. Because, you know, her motivation level and her initiative level is way higher than mine. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and she's like coming through the shop, Lucas, we need this, 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 and this. Why have you not ordered this? Hey, have you called the tire guy about picking up the scrap tires yet? No, ma'am. I have not. <laughs> Please don't tell my wife. She'll yell at me when I get home. Yeah. Um, you know, hey, there's there's a mess downstairs in the floor. I'm going to clean it up, but I'm going to do it this way. Right? And even little simple things like that, like cleaning up a spill in the shop, um, you know, the way that they handle that you know, are they using speedy dryer? Are they just throwing it down on it and leaving it? Are they sweeping it up? 
And, and those are kind of the, the way that we need to start. And, and, you know, in our group, we always talk about processes, policies, procedures. If there's an important process or policy or procedure in your shop, it's that new young tech that you're bringing in because everybody's talking like everybody right now is saying, we don't have any help. We don't have yeah. anybody to work for us. Uh, Why you know, don't going you come around up with a town solution? today? Everybody's comment was, "We're hiring, we're hiring, guys, we're hiring." <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. It's and that is, man. Think about how many jobs, uh, how many kids roll out of college, how many kids roll out of high school with very few prospects. Yeah, you know, if you have just yep. a regular degree, an associate's degree in you know business or or whatever, um, you got a long road to travel to get somewhere, and, and getting your foot in the door can be tough. That is, if there's any beauty on my end of this industry right now is that I can, I can send kids out with a big smile on my face knowing, Hey man, you know, if you, if you got the drive, if you have what it takes to succeed at all, you're gonna, cause there's plenty right. of opportunities here. Right. And, and, you know, that's really interesting because that's one of the things that uh, we keep talking about is that it is a technician's market. Yeah. Plain and simple right now. It is a technician's market. Um, and, and, you know, David has been posing this question to everybody that's been on the show lately. And, and a lot of these technicians are, are really pissed off. I mean, just downright pissed off at their shop or this experience that they've been through. And we're getting all these YouTube comments about this horrible experience this tech's having in this shop. Why the hell are they staying in crazy <laughs> shops? <laughs> Bingo. Like, I mean, th there are really good shops out there. You've been in them. I've been in them. Yep. We've got a group full of really amazing shop owners. Why do you, I mean, what is up with that? Why are these guys staying in these hack shops? Yeah. I, I, and I won't name any of the shops, but like I, when I moved up here, uh, you know, I, I put out some feelers and had a job the first week I was here and I thought, okay, great. And I hated it. I mean, it was terrible. I was like, right. this is toxic, man. This is so bad. Everyone in the back is, you know, they're, they're looking like they want to hang themselves. Everyone in the front is angry and, and bitter. And, and the poor customer is stuck in the middle getting destroyed. Now, there's right. no way I'm staying here. And I left, you know, I didn't, I didn't make it 60 days. I'm like, I'm out, man. Forget it. This, this life is too short. There's so many opportunities. If I don't like right. this place, I'll go to the next one. If I don't like that, I'll go to the next one. I'll find somebody that's compatible with my, my wants, my needs, and, and, you know, my moral you know, compass and I'll, and I'll stay with them. And I did. Right. And, you know, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing is I, I think that, um, a, I think that, that technicians are, they've never experienced what a good shop is. So I think you're right to leave the bad shop to go to a good shop. Yeah. I, I, uh, I I'm positive. You're right. I, I've talked with a few that, that, you know, that have been miserable at various places I've been at. And I'm like, why aren't you leaving? Ah, you know, man, you know, uh, it's probably just the same everywhere. And you're like, man, you'll never know, you know, that's it. Or, and that's sadly, it. and and I feel this way. And I, like, I went through this phase, uh, living down in, in Raleigh when I was working at the dealership and it was time for me to move on. I had this moment of, of fear of self doubt where I'm like, Oh no, you know, I, I don't, I don't really, I've only ever worked on Volvos. You know, maybe I'm really good at this, but <laughs> I don't want to work on other cars, you know? So if I leave this Volvo, I've got to, I've got to work on everything or I've got to work on something I've never touched and I'm going to start over. And I think that fear keeps guys stuck at dealerships that are toxic. Oh, right. well, you know, I don't want to drive an hour to the next Nissan dealership or the next you know, Honda dealership, but this one's no good to work at. So I'm stuck here. And, and that's like, uh, that's just that self doubt that people have. But the truth is you're a mechanic, you're a tech, yeah. you know, if you're awesome at one car, you'll be awesome at the next. Yeah. There'll be a, a learning curve, but It'll happen. Take the jump. Go yeah, for man. It, you know, a leap of faith. Look at what I'm doing right now. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you want to talk uh, about I mean, leap of faith. <laughs> the guys that have the confidence to say that and move on will be fine. But there are plenty who don't have the confidence. They they need something. So they show up at my door and they're like, oh, yeah, I can work on whatever. And then they're freaked out about some other make because that's not what they've been working on for the last 10 years. It's you know, yeah, you, you do. Know. I mean, you sweat. Yeah, I yeah, but there's a and like this guy. This guy was nervous, and I said, "No, you're a tech. You should be able to bolts or bolts. Yeah, right. No matter what you're you're given, bolts or bolts. So you should be fine. Don't don't stress about it. Just handle it like you would anything else. And no, it didn't work out. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah, right. couldn't couldn't handle it. Couldn't get past the the fear that he was dealing with something that wasn't the make that he had worked on for the last you know x amount of years. That's what he was comfortable with, and I'm I'm talking like he was physically making him ill oh, to man, work on terrible. something different. Yeah, and uh, he's probably out of the industry, but. I've seen that happen as well. So I, I can understand some of these guys not wanting to to make the jump, but the encouragement still needs to be made. Like that, that's yeah. ultimately what's gonna help fix the industry is is for the best techs, the better technicians, or at least the ones aspiring to be better technicians to leave the hack shops so they're not having to um, continue to contribute to some of the problems. And you know, that's, I say it to the, to the students I have that the timid rarely find success in life, no matter what career they choose. They hesitate, they worry, and so many opportunities pass them by. It sounds like that gentleman probably passed up a great opportunity to work with you. Uh, but you're right, yeah. There's, there's definitely ones that aren't going to pull that off. I'm an awful boss. Don't say yeah, that. you were harsh and cruel, for. weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just, you know, I, I'd say if I could give advice to techs thinking about leaving a toxic environment, do it, man. The worst you can do is fail. And the best part about failing is the opportunity to regroup, uh, realize what's actually important and, and do it again. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the ASOG podcast. If you'd like to catch these episodes early, you can do so by becoming a patron. Just go to ASOG.site and click on the become a patron now button. Becoming a patron helps support the show, gets you several perks, and is tax deductible. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast and on YouTube. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, or if you have any topic suggestions, please reach out to me via email. My email address is david at asog.site. That's D-A-V-I-D at A-S-O-G dot S-I-T-E. Until next time.